Well, good morning and welcome to Redeemer Presbyterian Church. It's good to see you all on this Lord's Day morning, this Resurrection Sunday, as we gather as always to exalt and enjoy Jesus Christ in our time together. If you happen to be a guest with us today, maybe a returning guest or with us for the first time, we're so thankful that you have uh, come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ with us together this morning. And as you came in, I, I hope you were able to grab a bulletin as it will be a guide to you, a useful friend to you as we offer our hearts and minds to the Lord in worship this morning as various parts of the service we might be reading together, even lyrics that we're singing together printed there uh, in your bulletin. And if you grab it and make your way to the announcements page, you'll notice a couple of things important as it relates to today at the end of the service, the deacons will be collecting uh, funds for the Deacon Fund as they do every fifth Sunday in the morning service. And as we do every fifth Sunday in the evening, we'll have, in lieu of our normal evening worship time, we'll have a time to spend from 5 to 6 p.m. tonight in, in prayer. We'll start for a few minutes in here in this room, and then we're actually going to gravitate towards the east side expansion over there to pray for a number of things related to the Lord's work and the expansion work here at, at Redeemer. And as you came in, I'm sure you noticed some of that mess and some of the craziness that belongs to the expansion work. And those of you who are members here at Redeemer know in recent weeks we've told you to expect craziness in a larger sense to begin over the next week or so. But as we have so often remarked along building expansion, we live by faith, not by sight. And, and these kind of things, uh, a number of things, namely City of McKinney inspection plans have caused what was going to be demolition day tomorrow to get pushed back uh, a number of weeks till later on, probably in April, maybe even the first week in May. So uh, j just know that that means... Things are going to continue as you see it today in here without any walls in the back of the room being dis demolished and other temporary entrances coming in the next a few weeks. And before we turn our attention to the Ubalate Choir and preparing our hearts for uh, worship this morning, uh, when we get to the moment after the call to worship to rise to sing our hymn of praise, you can certainly help us out along the way if, as we stand to sing, if you pinch towards the middle of the section, so therefore around the outside of the aisles, the deacons will be able to usher people in as they come along the way in the rest of this morning's service. But as we uh, do want to ready our souls to worship the Lord this morning, uh, we'll do so as the Ubalate Choir choir sings, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Please now join me in standing as God calls us to worship from Psalm 118, verse 24. Hear now what the Spirit is speaking to us. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us begin our worship and sing hymn of praise, hymn number 286, Worship Christ the Risen King. Thank you. 
let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh, God of creation and new creation, we praise you for the miracle of Easter. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. We thank you, great God, for the hope we have in Jesus, who died but is risen and rules over all. Joyful is the song we make this morning, for this day liberates us from doubt and fear. Thankful is the song we sing, for this day moves us past darkness and despair. Hopeful is the prayer upon our lips, for this day awakens in us long-awaited new life. For Christ, our Passover lamp, is sacrificed for us to receive power and wealth, wisdom and might, honor and glory and blessing. Lord, we praise you for his presence with us. Because he lives, we look for eternal life, knowing that nothing past, present, or yet to come can separate us from your great, great love made known in Jesus Christ. We adore you, Father God, and pray especially for those who join us for worship and whose lives are filled with pain, loss, or deep sadness. May they sense how the resurrection is a new beginning and a source of great hope, joy, and victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. As we do every Sunday here at Redeemer, we take time to read from God's law. Uh, this is a time in which we use to reflect upon our guilt and the need for a Savior. And if this is your first time with us this morning... I'd ask that you reflect on the words that were about to be read from the holy, uh, the holy words of Scripture. May these words uh, indeed reflect a need for a Savior from our sins. And so if you look at your bulletins with me, we're now going, I'm now going to read from Romans 6, uh, verses 9 through 11. And so it reads, we, now, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died... He died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks indeed. If you're like me and you drive to church on Sunday mornings, perhaps you turn on Christian radio or you listen to your favorite uh, Christian artist. For me and my family, that person is Sandra McCracken. And she has a song that's called Upon a Life. And in there, she has a a powerful verse, and she says, Both my death and life I read, my guilt and pardon there I see. So once again, as you engage Scripture, the prayer is that the Lord will use the law to show your guilt. It is the mercy of God that the law was given so that we have pardon through Jesus Christ. And so now let us enter into a corporate confession of sin. Let us recite this together, and we will enter a moment of silence as you all reflect on your sins one by one. Let's read together. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that instead of living alive to Jesus Christ, we have pursued dead works. Instead of living for your glory in all things, we have indulged the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life. We admit the new obedience has been too often absent from our lives. Forgive us and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules for the world and is head of the church, his body. Amen. Please now go to the Lord in the private confession and name your sins one by one. (laughs) 
Father, may these sins that we pray about be forgiven. May we have full confidence in the forgiveness and the salvation that is given by your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Beloved, if you place your faith in Christ, if you have, if you have confessed your sins, I declare to you, indeed, you are forgiven. And we find that promise of forgiveness from Colossians 2, verses 13 and 14, which reads, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Now, if you're able, please rise and let us sing the psalm of trust found in Psalter, page 10 of the Psalm 16, to the tune of, Not What My Hands Have Done.
Please remain standing while we join together in the affirmation of faith, which today comes from the larger catechism, question 52. Uh, I will ask the question, and we will all recite the answer together. People of God, how was Christ exalted in the resurrection? Christ was exalted in his resurrection, in that not having seen corruption in death, of which it was not possible for him to be held, and having the very same body which he suffered, really united to his soul. He rose again from the dead, the third day by his own power, whereby he declared himself to be the Son of God, to have satisfied divine justice, to have vanquished death, and him that had power of it, and to be Lord of the great and dead, all of which he did as a public person, the head of the church, for their justification, redeeming the race, supporting his enemies, and to assure them of their resurrection from the dead at the last day. Well, you may be seated. We do come to our point as we do every Lord's Day morning here at Redeemer as we spend some extended time offering our needs and hearts to the Lord in intercessory prayer, knowing that, of course, He listens to us, He delights to receive our prayers as we offer them in the name of His beloved Son. This is one way, of course, that we not only express our need and dependence upon the Lord, but we, of course, exalt and honor Him, for He alone is, is able to answer us. So let us uh, pray together this morning as we continue. Uh, Father, we do come to You this day, this uh, day of days, knowing that You hear us, and that You meet us according to Your covenant promise. Uh, we do ask that You would answer us again. For you are our great God of righteousness. You have so many times given us relief when we have been distressed. And be gracious to us again today and hear our cries. Now we praise you that by faith you have raised us from death to life in Jesus Christ. We know that Christ's resurrection means death and sin no longer have dominion over us. And we also know that you have commanded us to consider our lives dead to sin, living before you in righteousness and holiness, and yet, uh, Father, how often we must confess that we have presented our members as instruments of unrighteousness instead of righteousness. Uh, may we, by your Spirit, mortify our flesh and, and sinful desires. May we find holiness and godliness uh, growing in us that we might truly reflect your son's resurrection life. And we pray that life, that comfort, that, that mercy and your sovereign grace would belong to Norm Hearsink as his brother John passed away this week after four years of battling with cancer. Uh, we praise you that John's trust was in Jesus Christ and ask that his family find immense comfort in knowing that John's faith is now made sight. We pray, too, that you would comfort Les and Linda Ackerman as Les was diagnosed with cancer earlier this week. Give him patience as he awaits on next steps and tests that will guide the coming weeks and months. And may that same power that rose Jesus from the dead give life to Les's body. We also lift up the little ones in our midst to you this day. What a joy it is to... Know and praise a Savior who commanded the children come to Him, that we not hinder them from coming to Jesus, for unto them belongs the kingdom of heaven. And uh, we ask that all of the children in our room today would close with Jesus Christ, that they would trust in Him and Him alone as their Savior. Let them also thrive in the Spirit. May they be a blessing to their parents honoring and obeying them all of their days, and help them always to know that your word is better than life, that it is a treasure greater than gold and silver. We ask, too, that all the churches in our city and, and county would 
be faithful this day as many guests walk through church, church doors for the first time in many months, and no doubt others for the first time in, in many years. Uh, do pour your spirit out upon every church this day that uh, preachers would declare your gospel with, with power, with, with tenderness, with, with gladness, that Christ died for our sins and was raised on the third day. Lord, we know without his resurrection, our faith would be pointless, our preaching would have no purpose, and we'd be left in our sins, but... We rejoice this day that Christ has been raised and ask that you would raise many souls to new life in Christ through the preaching of that very gospel. And uh, we pray the gospel would encourage the hundreds of pastors that gather this week at the Twin Lakes Fellowship in Jackson, Mississippi. May you uh, fit these men in readiness to minister Jesus Christ as they long to have hearts of holiness and faithfulness uh, before you. I do bless those even in our church that travel to Mississippi this week to find encouragement and nourishment in the fellowship of, of brothers in the ministry. Uh, we do know that you call us to pray not only for those that are near to us, but also those that are far from us. And so we pray for your gospel to grow in the nation of Congo even this week and this year. Let Churches in that country declare a pure gospel, one that's free of syncretism and falsehood. Uh, may your church recapture a heart for evangelism and missions that reaches the whole country regardless of class, regardless of, of stature. Uh, we do know there are immense numbers of youth in the next generation that are apart from Christ Jesus, and we pray that Ministries in the nation would expand that would reach the young people and equip them to shine as lights as those living among a crooked generation. And finally, Father, we do ask this day that you would fill our souls with living hope. We do pray that you would forgive us that we have so often rested our hopes on powers and possessions that have no capability to guide the soul into eternity. And we remember that our Savior who was once dead, has risen, and we like those who were like those who once had no hope in the world, but now we have eternal hope in Christ Jesus. And so help us to rejoice this day that our Savior, because of your great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through his very resurrection to an eternal inheritance that he's keeping for us in heaven and we thank you for guarding us for the salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. That salvation, we even pray, would dawn upon us now as we continue praying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's stand together as we continue to worship the Lord with our voices, children age four and five. If your parents so desire, you can be released for children's worship. Your teachers are at the back of the room ready to greet you. And as we again sing of the glories of an open an empty tomb, let us turn our attention to our bulletins and the hymn of meditation, four stanzas of Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery.
be seated once again. Uh, the deacons uh, will come forward in just a moment as they uh, collected the offering this morning, which is a way that we faithfully obey God's command to give uh, generously and sacrificially out of what He has given to us to steward it for the uh, advance of the gospel. And if you're seated on one of the inside rows, there should be a registration pad there in front of you. We'd love to know that you were uh, with us this day. and. You can fill it out and pass it to the outside of the row. And as we uh, give back to the Lord and as we even continue our hearts to hear, ready to hear his truth this morning, uh, we'll do so as the choir sings an Easter call to praise. Stand with me as we rise to read our sermon passage this morning. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, you can make your way to the fourth book of the New Testament. You'll find our text this morning in John uh, chapter 20. It was almost a year ago that we began our studies in John's gospel. And I remember when we started out in April of, of last year, I thought, you know, we might be at John 20. 
uh, John's Easter passage on Easter of 2024. And by the end of the fall, I thought, I think we're going to get there in Easter of 2024. And it was only a few months ago that as I laid it out, I'm like, oh, yes, we are going to get there on Easter of 2024. And so the text that we want to read and notice this morning is the first 18 verses of chapter 20. So let me read that for us, and then I'll pray for God's blessing on our study, and we'll begin together. So do listen once again as the Lord speaks to you uh, through his perfect word. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, And said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb, and both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. And the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look in the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And he said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Let's pray once again. Lord, we do rejoice this day that you are near to us. By your word and spirit, may we store up your word of resurrection in our heart this day, that we might cling to your testimonies, for they are the joy of our souls, and we know they point us to our resurrected King. So help us to see him this day, the one in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, Two years of my high school life was spent in something of a soccer sojourn in Florida, I lived there year-round, training with a team as we were preparing for a particular uh, tournament, and it was there while living in Florida that I ended up graduating from high school uh, a year early. So as my teammates would go off to their senior year of high school, I was back in this kind of condominium area where we all stayed, and I had hours on hand to occupy every single day for months on end. And one of the things that I did to occupy those hours at that time in my life is I made my first foray into the Lord of the Rings series, reading and completing those books along the way in a uh, fall semester. And I can still uh, vividly remember coming to a scene in one of the books where a main character apparently dies. And I was just kind of struck out of my mind. You know, shocked, surprised, and even saddened to a large degree. And so I got up and raced over to the shelf to grab the next book. And some of you might have done something like this before. And you just fervently scan through the pages, thinking, surely he can't die. Because the story would, at least for someone like me, be rather worthless if he died. 
it would seem altogether pointless if, if he died. Maybe you've had a sense like that before in a movie you've seen. Everything is good until the end. Then someone dies. And it's all pointless. That seems to be all not worth it. And where we pick up the story in John's gospel today is in that moment, if you can understand that moment. Because, of course, where we left off last week at the end of chapter 19, you might glance up to verse 42, that final verse of chapter 19. The tomb was close at hand, and Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, laid Jesus there in this garden tomb. Jesus, the long-expected Messiah, Jesus who was the Redeemer, Jesus who was the Savior, he had been crucified. The Jews' sin and hatred of Jesus, Pilate's unbelief, indifference towards Jesus had brought about this eternal plan that, of course, long ago had been predestined, that the Lamb would be slain for sinners. And we, you might remember from last week, we, we heard that the final words that Jesus shouted, uh, cried out from Calvary was, was, it is finished. And we know on the other side of that cry, what it meant. Atonement is accomplished. The fountain of forgiveness is, is, is finally opened. We know that. But recognize the disciples, those who heard that cry, they don't know that. What do they know? Shock. Sadness. No doubt, desolation and despair. Their master was gone. And as the text will make clear to us today, they did not expect him to come out of a grave. Was it all worth it following Jesus? Was it all for naught years of being his disciples? But as one old preacher so eloquently said, it's Friday, sin is winning. The world is grinning. Satan is a laughing. But Sunday's coming. And of course, on Sunday, what we know from verse 8, if you glance down, the first person to understand something of resurrection power had happened is actually this unnamed disciple that we want to understand is John. You'll see he saw and believed. And it's from those two simple verbs that we're just going to take our simple theme along the way this morning because, of course, this text is here before you to, to paint a picture before your mind's eye that you too would see and believe. That's, that's the reason it's here, that every single one of you would see what happened and believe in what happened. So I want you today to see and believe the resurrected Lord, and you'll notice if your Bible is like mine, it comes in two distinct halves, verses 1 through 8, I'm sorry, verse 1 through 10, uh, we're going to want to look at the resurrected Lord, and verses 11 through 18, we want to listen to the resurrected Lord. So first, we want to look, and notice who we look at first. Verse 1 tells us, once again, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. Now, students, I wonder if you know anything about this woman named Mary Magdalene. Uh, her name is one that is known throughout the world. I think rightly celebrated throughout the world. But you might not know, the only thing that we conclusively know about Mary Magdalene comes from Luke chapter 8. And we know two things conclusively. One, that she was wealthy. She was one of the main supporters financially of Jesus' ministry. Two, Jesus had cast out seven demons from her. So she's a woman of means and a woman that has known the, the mercy and ministry of, of Jesus Christ. But, but that alone, of course, wouldn't seem to be reason why the world all over knows and celebrates this name Mary Magdalene. Well, really the reason the world knows and celebrates Mary Magdalene is the third thing that we know about her. She was there. The first one looking in on the tomb, all four gospel authors, they, they magnify Mary as that first witness to the resurrection. And you want to know, though, she's not looking for resurrection as she's going to the tomb early that Sunday morning. 
We know that from other gospels. She's going with other women. They're going there with spices to anoint Jesus' body according to the ancient custom. And notice how verse 1 ends, while it was still dark, she saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now you can underline that, that verb there of taken away because a lot of times, isn't it true in our own tradition that we sing songs, we, we read reports of a stone rolled away from the tomb. But that's not the verb that John uses here. It's taken away. Actually, you could translate it as like lifted up and placed aside. This is not something that ordinary people would do at that time. Uh, you would expect it to just be kind of shoved to the side, rolled away, but this is taken up, lifted, and moved to the side. Maybe someone that has the power to treat this stone like it was just one you could skip across the sea, you know, has, has done something here. Mary notices that it's empty. She runs to Simon Peter and, and John, notice the end of verse 2, saying they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have laid him. So you'll understand this moment better if you recognize that Mary isn't looking for resurrection. She's going to anoint him with spices. She does not think a resurrection has occurred. She thinks robbery has occurred. Some sort of grave robbery that's taken the body, maybe to humiliate it further. Or maybe to prevent Jesus' disciples from coming to this tomb to venerate and honor their master. We know that grave robbery was so common in the Roman Empire that only about 10 years after this moment, the Roman emperor has to actually attach capital punishment to grave robbery because it was so common. So she thinks his body has been stolen. She thinks some act of vandalism has happened. So she reports to John and to Peter, we don't know where it is. And if you glance through the next two verses, you'll see they begin to walk towards the tomb. Uh, clearly, they weren't that far away from where Jesus was laid. But interestingly enough, in a way that, of course, only John's gospel reports, you'll look at verse 4, eventually they're running together. But the other disciple, that being John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And because no scripture is pointless, uh, people throughout the ages have wondered why John wants us to know he got there first instead of Peter. There, there must be a point. Some of the more common answers would be, well, John's trying to tell us in a rather coded way that he's younger and Peter's older. Uh, something of a, a normal, actually, spiritual application of this text is that, that Peter's turtle trot was because he was weighed down with, with guilt and grief over having denied Jesus only hours before. And now maybe he realizes how wrong he's gone. But what's interesting is they get to the tomb. And in ways that ought to be striking to you, their involvement there with an empty tomb is altogether different. Because you see in verse 5, John doesn't go in. You see, he's stooping to look in. It's almost as though the sight is too holy for him to enter in. He's ran faster, so he gets there first. Peter has ran slower, so he gets there second. And as we've remarked many times in this study of John's gospel, Peter, isn't he? He's always popping up and and popping off. He's got this insistence about him, and it's almost as though the scene paints the picture as, as John is leaning into this doorway, which was probably only about three feet tall. It was not a tall doorway that you would get through. He's kind of stooping in to look, and it's as though Peter gets there, shoves him to the side. Notice verse 6, he came following him, went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. It's striking how different is their response to this empty tomb. And maybe we can take a simple encouragement from it, even noticing here how the Lord loves to save, to call, to summon different kind of people, people who have a little bit more reserved, perhaps patient, peaceful approach to looking in on Jesus. People more zealous, throwing people out of the way to get to Jesus. And the Lord saves, doesn't he? Different kind of people with different kinds of personalities. That he's growing us all in Christ's likeness doesn't mean he's making us all clones. He loves John. He loves Peter. Peter notices John's reporting, of course, something is off. That's the way you're meant to understand it. Something is off about these grave garments. 
They're all neatly folded. It's not what you'd expect if robbery or vandalism has happened. You know, students, you would know, what would you normally associate with a crime scene? Chaos, mess, things thrown about. If someone was wanting to steal Jesus' body, it seems as though they just yanked his body out and the cloths would be doing something other than being simply and clearly folded up. Perhaps even this folded headcloth is a sign, John wants us to know, that something supernatural has taken place. If you were staring into the tomb in that moment, you would think, maybe Jesus got up and walked out after he folded these cloths up. That's what John evidently thinks happened, because notice verse 8, he who reached the tomb first also goes in, and John saw and believed. You notice verse 9, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. You know, people have often wondered if we really should put full faith in John's heart in this moment, because maybe he saw and believed Mary's report, yes, they've taken the body. Or maybe he just saw and simply believed something unknown and mysteriously wonderful had taken place. But if you connect it to what he says in verse 9, it's quite clear, isn't it? He believed that Jesus had been raised from the dead. But he did not know why the scripture, at this point, he did not know why the scripture had said, Jesus must rise from the dead. I wonder if you know the reasons why the scripture says, Jesus must rise from the dead. Do you have passages and and truths that come into your mind about why he must rise from the dead? If you put all of those things together, you can simply answer the reason for Jesus' must rising from the dead. It just belongs to three simple things. If he didn't rise, you're still in your sins. If he didn't rise, faith is futile. If he didn't rise, preaching has no purpose or power. Why? Because if he didn't rise, there's no good news. But John sees and believes. He's looking for the resurrected king. And you too today must look for the resurrected king. Consider how much of this past week you likely spent looking for something significant. You might be looking for a new job posting. You might be looking to make sure that the latest deposit hits your bank account. You might be looking for new shows to stream on Netflix. You might be looking at social media to see how your life compares to people that you admire and appreciate. But how much time did you spend this last week looking for a resurrected king. We, of course, don't have a physical, empty tomb displayed before us today that we can stoop and look for a resurrected king. But what you need to know is part of this good news that we so love and adore and preach and rejoice in is that through that gospel he's given us, haven't he, before our very eyes, an empty tomb, that we would look, that we would see resurrection has happened. Seeing and believing means you first need to look for the resurrected king. Secondly, in the back half of our passage, it means we must also listen to the resurrected king. Some of you are are old enough to remember April of 1966. It was a time in our nation's history when the Vietnam War was hot. The counterculture was stirring up no small amount of interest Civil rights activism was booming. Politics were were toxic. It was a time at which so many people in the American culture thought life was nothing more than struggling and suffering. And it was in that context that Time Magazine printed a cover story that was unprecedented in its history. And it was unprecedented because there was no photo attached. uh, no, No picture on the cover. It was simply a black cover with red letters asking a three word question. In this climate, in this culture of struggle and suffering, it simply asked, is God dead? So often, people in the midst of struggling and suffering may not ask, is God dead? But may internally be living as though God is dead. Mary here is at the tomb thinking the Son of God is dead. 
Because you'll notice in verse 10, John and Peter have gone back to their house. Verse 11 tells us that Mary's still there at the tomb, and she finally stoops in again to look. Verse 12 tells us she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and, and one at the feet. And, and kids, you can almost picture these angels, can't you, as like bookends to where Jesus' body was. This kind of light immediately piercing the darkness. She evidently hadn't seen them before. There they are sitting there. And the question that comes to her in verse 13 is, woman, why are you weeping? And she, of course, says, well, they've taken the body and we don't know where to find him. But, but even that question, why are you weeping, uh, tells us that this kind of angelic presence is altogether appropriate. I mean, really, in many ways, the absence of angels in such an act of resurrection uh, would seemingly miss heaven's affirmation on the power that had been worked there at the empty tomb. But the, the presence of the angels is altogether appropriate. The, the presence of Mary's anguish, anxiety, the angels are saying, that's inappropriate. Well, why are you weeping? Well, we can understand, can't we, and even sympathize with Mary how sometimes anxiety and anguish it can so blind our hearts and souls that when the answer is genuinely at our right hand, we still can't see it. We still don't grasp it. We, we don't understand it. And in a way that I've always wondered, you'll notice the next verse tells us that Mary turns around. And maybe you're like me. I want to know why she turned around. I mean, you would think angels are displayed in front of her, asking her a question. She's given an answer. Wouldn't you kind of fix your gaze on the angels? But she, she turns around, so maybe they suddenly bowed down. Maybe she heard a rustling behind her. I've sometimes wondered if just an angel said in response to Mary saying, we don't know where they've taken him. He just did this. And she turns around. And she notices some guy. <laughs> Some guy in the garden. Look at verse 14. She turned around and saw Jesus. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Maybe she didn't know it was Jesus because we know from later gospel accounts, after his resurrection, he clearly hid his identity on certain occasions from disciples. I think it's actually much more likely is that she just didn't recognize Jesus. Because what more often happens in later gospel accounts after Jesus' resurrection, it's as though his body in its more glorified and perfective state doesn't as immediately look like the Jesus that they were used to. Well, yes, it's his body. It has wounds in the side and in the hands. So yes, as we'll see next week, Thomas can touch them. So it's similar enough, but it's different enough that he doesn't immediately look the exact same. Because it's true after all, isn't it, that resurrection, glorification, means transformation. Jesus asks her the exact same question as the angels. Notice verse 15, woman, why are you weeping? But he advances it further. Whom are you seeking? And that's a wonderful question to ask often of friends, family members, and your own heart. What are you looking for in this life? What are you seeking after? In your days, whom are you seeking? He's saying to Mary, why are you here? And maybe even the Lord through his word and spirit is asking you that very question. Why are you here? She again explains, of course, what's going on. Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. So I want you to see three things as we begin to bring this to a close as you notice Mary's interaction with the resurrected king that you might not just look to him but also listen to him. First thing I want you to see is the context of his word. Because you'll notice at the beginning of verse 15, she supposes him to be the gardener. We know from last week at the end of chapter 19, Jesus was laid in a tomb in a garden. And it makes sense. It ought to that the first scene of a resurrected Lord in John's gospel is in a garden. For this gospel, unlike any other gospels, it begins with these clear echoes of Genesis. It closes with echoes of Genesis. Because I trust that you know it was in Genesis that Adam and Eve, they fell in a garden. 
They who were supposed to be image bearers of God, vice regents of God, extending his garden kingdom to the ends of the earth, because of their sin, they were cast out east of Eden. And Jesus, who is, according to the New Testament, the second Adam, the last Adam, isn't it altogether appropriate and right that when he speaks for the first time in this gospel after his resurrection, he's in a garden And it's through the speaking of his gospel that what is he doing? Advancing his garden kingdom even now to the ends of the earth. For when he returns in the new heavens and the new earth, what is he bringing with him but a garden city? Where we as his people hear him speak to us. Look on him in all his beauty and glory. But it's not just the context of his word that you need to hear. It's also the call of his word. For look at verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary. You'd love to have a tone meter on text like this. What did it sound like? Was it earnest? Mary! Sure seems much more likely, doesn't it? That there was something of this gentle pleading. Mary. Our kids were watching this animated movie a few weeks ago, and one of the children said along the way, after a character had spoken a couple of times, who's his voice? Yeah, he sounds familiar. And Mary, of course, hears her name, and she doesn't just think, ah, he sounds familiar, this gardener. She knows exactly who's talking, for you see how she responds at the end of verse 16. She turned to him and said in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Here's the perfect living example in John's gospel of the very good shepherd discourse we heard in chapter 10, where Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep know my name. And I call them, and they listen. He says, Mary. And with one single word, light dispels the darkness. Life removes the death. Hope replaces the hopelessness. Some of you, I'm sure, are living testimonies how one word from Jesus can change a life. And I hope you know that he continues to do that one word ministry through his gospel, even in settings like this. Sometimes isn't it true as though the the Lord takes the word and through the preaching of that very text, it's as though he looks right at your heart and simply says, Joe, Jack, Jill, Jim, Bob, Betty. And everything changes. I wonder if you've heard him speak his word of grace over your life. So there's a context to his word. There's a call to his word. There's also a commission. Finally, verse 17, he says to Mary, don't cling to me for I've not yet ascended to the Father. Evidently, and noticing Jesus, she's either hugging him, maybe she's fallen at his feet, clutching him there. And he says, don't hold on to me. Uh, I, I have not yet ascended to the Father. It's a text that one commentator says is among the most difficult to understand and the New Testament, because you can take it a variety of different ways. There's four or five main views on it. But I think it's just simply Jesus saying, Mary, you need to let go. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. But you need to go somewhere right now. Uh, There's a commission. And you see that commission that comes at the end of verse 17. Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. You know that we live in a time, don't you, that people talk about pronouns a lot? We as Christians love pronouns in the Bible. There's gospel in you saying, this is my God and my Father. There's gospel in you saying yes and amen to me saying, this is your God and your Father. There's gospel in Jesus Christ looking at you and saying, mine, my people. Mary, go and tell them what has happened. So you notice the end of the text tells us Mary goes and tells them exactly what has happened. She's looked at the resurrected Lord. She's listened to the resurrected Lord. She's seen and believed in the resurrected Lord. One of the greatest English preachers during World War II in London was a man named William Sangster. 
He was a Methodist preacher whose church was only around the bend from Westminster Abbey. And uh, all throughout World War II, um, for so many months, his, his church basement was basically a shelter for people under the refuge from bombing. It was something over 1,600 days that his church had ministry to those in suffering and hardship. And it was uh, late in his life that he was diagnosed with an incurable disease that meant his, his body, his muscles were atrophying by the month. And kids, that's just a way of saying his muscles began to paralyze at the end of his life. So eventually, a preacher known throughout the English-speaking world, and to some degree even throughout the world, his throat begins to seize up and he can't speak anymore. Even closer to the end of his life, his hands started being so difficult that he could barely write. What was on the final Easter before he died that he was able to scribble something out to his family. And he said this, How terrible to wake up on Easter and have no voice to shout, He is risen. That's a terrible thing. But he continued, Far worse is having a voice and not wanting to shout, He is risen. Friends, He is risen. See and believe this day and tell of what you've seen. Tell of what you believe. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are making all things new. A promise a pronouncement that you have given to us and even sealed with the very resurrection of your Son. Make new creatures out of us this day. May we no longer cling to what is past, but look ahead to what is coming. Hasten that very coming, that final resurrection. We ask in the name of our beloved Savior and our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let us stand together as we do respond to God's word, turning our hymnals once again to number 277 as we sing, Christ the Lord is risen today.
Amen. You may be seated. You may have been greeted this morning as you came with those words, he has risen, and you know what those words mean, and your response back is, he is risen indeed. So if I say, he is risen, he is, risen indeed. is the response. What are you saying with that response? You're saying, I believe him. I know it was true. He actually rose from the dead, and I believe it, as do you. And we do the same thing, don't we, every week when we come to this table. We proclaim and remember that what he has given us in this supper, that he did die for us, that he did raise from the dead, and that he is coming again. And we hear those words, don't we, every week, those words of institution that he gave us. And we'll do that again this morning on this day that we celebrate his resurrection. We follow him in his instruction for us for this meal. Why? Because he told us to do it until he comes again. And we're going to do that together. Now, who is eligible? Who is the Lord calling to this table? And on a week like this, it's particularly important, isn't it? Everyone who has put their faith in Jesus Christ, if you are here and you are a member of a gospel-preaching church, this one or anyone, this table is for you. It's for baptized, confessing believers. If that's you, this is an invitation for you to come. But if you're here and that is not you, you have a unique invitation this morning. And you've heard it preached from the pulpit that Christ came and died and rose again. And your invitation, if you are here, is to come running to this Savior to close with Christ, to become one of his followers. But this table is not for you if that, is, if that is your invitation. Your invitation is to hear the words that you've heard preached and come by faith in Christ. And we would love nothing more than to help you do that. But stay in your seat as the warning is clear from the Apostle Paul that to take the supper unworthily, and that is not, not being one of his and having made a profession. This is a table that is not yet set for you. But if you're here and this is the table that's set for you, I welcome you to come, come to the Savior in this meal. And if you're seated by those that you love and know, thank him together as the elements are being passed. Because when we say he is risen, he is risen indeed, we are saying that he truly rose from the dead. And what we're saying in this meal is that as real as this bread is, and it's real bread, it's all it is. There's a recipe and it's made and we eat it and taste it, but it's real. And this cup is real wine and real juice and we smell it and we taste it. And the message is, as real as these elements, was as real as Christ died for you. Let's come now to this table rejoicing together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue to worship, uh, we praise you. We praise you that uh, you won victory over death, raising Jesus from the grave and giving us eternal life. Oh, Lord Jesus, we honor you. We adore you. That you overcame, you overcame sin and death and opened the gate to everlasting life. You endured the shame of the cross. And today is the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, as we come together to partake of the Lord's Supper. Your, your broken body and the bloodshed, they will strengthen our faith and unite us together as one body. And said, we pray that you will send us out to proclaim the good news 
our Lord Jesus is risen and he reigns. May the Spirit of the Lord be with us, be with the elements as we all celebrate together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took a bread. After giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Elders will be serving the communion surely, so please remain seated and hold elements until all have been served so that we can partake together as a family. Elders, now please come forward. The broken body of Christ, new life in Christ Jesus, take and eat in remembrance of him. Did you hear those words? They continue. In like manner, in the same way, he took the cup after supper. And when he blessed it, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. As long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth my death until I come again. 
be reminded that the wine is dark in color, the grape juice is light in color. We will hold it until we can all take and partake together. O Christians, rejoice. The blood of Jesus Christ takes away all of our sin. Take and drink. Amen. Let's stand for the doxology. Thank you for joining us. May our service this morning be an encouragement to you and honoring unto the Lord. Now please raise your hands and receive the benediction as God sends his blessings out. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, 
the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.